Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lisi's News, Views, and To-Dos. Today, I'm so thrilled to welcome my friend, Melissa Prince, Chief Client Value and Innovation Officer at Ballard Spar LLP in Philadelphia. Melissa, thanks so much for being on today. Thanks so much for having me. My title's kind of a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. I love, I love exactly what it is that you do, and I'm excited to talk about it more today. So, me too. Um, <laughs> Melissa, let's dive right into it. I'm interested to hear what news would you like to share with our audience? What's going on in your world? Well, so I think the, the most newsworthy thing that's going on right now is um, something that we're working on with our diversity and inclusion folks at Ballard. We're developing a new, a new diversity and inclusion dashboard. We've always been kind of tracking things internally to look at our internal diverse teams and when we're pricing things and when we're putting together budgets for the teams and talking to clients about the matters that we're undertaking. We're always talking about the team structure and who we're using because diversity is really, really important to us. But we also started to create client-facing dashboards recently. And what's really cool about them is we can track client-specific diversity goals so say you're a client that's interested in, in following the ABA protocol and you want to look at, you know, the number of women, the number, number of racially diverse people that are on our teams, the LGBTQ folks on the team, and we develop a dashboard that kind of shows what your goal is as a client versus what we're working um, in terms of the team structure for each of your matters. Um, and I think what, and we look at the hours and then we also look at the fees that are worked because a lot of times what we see is you'll see a really diverse team um, from an hours perspective, but sometimes the partners who work more fees on the matters are the ones that are less diverse in certain client situations. And so we really wanna be transparent about what we're showing our clients. It's in real time. It, um, we provide clients a link to the dashboard. We, it gets updated daily as people release their time. And you can drill down by the year and by the matter to see the client diversity information. Um, that's so and in terms cool. of, yeah, and in terms of what we've been doing for clients, that's the thing that people have been the most excited about that we've done recently. And so I think that as we work with more and more clients and get more feedback on how the dashboard looks, it will only get better over time. Yeah. So I'm interested. Are I heard you talking about client goals about diversity. Are you proactively sharing this information with clients that aren't necessarily specifically requesting diversity or, you know, diverse teams? And as sort of a subset of that question, do you even have clients who are not specifically tracking that or requesting diverse teams yet? So I think some clients are more focused on it than others, but I think it's definitely becoming something that's really, really important in the industry. And I see that as a, an overall like really positive thing because I think if law firms are changing the way that they're staffing teams and if firms like Ballard really care about diversity requirements, but the clients themselves are not asking for that, it's just a challenge to figure out how we meet client needs in that regard. Um, we are sharing it with all clients, regardless of if they've told us that they're tracking diversity. And so um, as part of our client portal experience, the, you know, the intent is really to provide value adds from a financial and diversity perspective. And there are a bunch of other things that we do, legislative tracking and litigation tracking and deal tracking and CLE tracking. Um, but we include those diversity dashboards in what we're developing for clients. And so say we put together a client portal, it's just an automatic now that we include those diversity dashboards. And when we're demoing the dashboards for the clients, we show them that and the functionality and we ask for feedback. And so the, um, the goal really is to be iterative in this process and for us to be proactive, because I think that's really what's going to make the biggest change. Um, yeah. I guess the other thing that I'll add is that I think sometimes um, when you're developing portals and dashboards and things, people just, it, they're so new and legal that people don't know what they want. And so we found huge success in developing something to show them, you know, even if it's not perfect, even if the goal is to be more iterative over time, because, I, I, because otherwise you're just talking at people and they don't really understand what you're saying. So it's, that's been really a positive thing. Yeah. I just to go back to the diversity information in particular, obviously I know Ballard to be a, a 
firm that I always say puts its money where it mouth, its mouth is when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Um, so I am excited to hear that this is something that you're focusing on because I know that it is truly of value to the firm and even proactively sharing it, the information with clients, even if they're not asking for it, I truly believe to be a differentiator for the firm. So kudos to you and the, the entire team on that. Um, and then just, yeah, and on the, the second point about sharing information, because people don't necessarily know exactly what it is they're looking for. I struggle that with that myself. I often tell myself, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, because I want to figure out all the things that would be of value or in, you know, insightful to a client or, you know, information data that I want to share. But your point, I think, is spot on. You have to sort of start somewhere and um, work through it iteratively. So you're getting to the information that's actually of value. So um, I'm excited that you said that. <laughs> um, just a, I guess kind of a follow on from that question. I always like to ask people, what do you think is changing? What do you see is changing in the legal industry? And, and what do you see the major impact um, will, of that change will be? So I think so many things are changing right now in the legal industry. And I think, you know, the, 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 the debatable topic at this point is whether it's a permanent change. Mm. I'm one who thinks that it is. So um, we're seeing a lot more technology adoption than we've ever seen before, both in terms of operational technology in law firms and with clients, and also the client technology that law firms are building and are, and frankly are using, you know, th basic thing, well, things that I would consider somewhat basic, like Zoom, like Teams, like WebEx, all of those things are being adopted as a place for teams to come together, to have client meetings, to collaborate. And, and that seems to me like the biggest revolution kind of that we've had. And so I think that's only gonna continue. Um, also, I think the way that we're thinking in legal about office space is changing. And so I, a lot of larger law firms now, including us, are thinking about what space we need going forward. Um, they, you know, we're asking our employees and our lawyers questions about whether they you know, feel more comfortable working from home in the short term and even in the long term, or if they like to hotel. So I think that we're going to be, you know, a lot of law firms are going to be rethinking the space idea with a goal of creating collaborative environments for people to work where people, you know, so there's well, there's a wellness component to that. And then also saving money and efficiency for clients. So that's reflected in what we're charging them in terms of fees. Mm. And so I think over time, it'll be interesting to watch those things um, to figure out how we create the law firm of the future where a lot more people are working remotely from their homes and still create an environment where people feel like they're connected to their mm -hmm. community. At Ballard, we care a lot about our culture. Our culture is extremely important to us. And so how we maintain that culture in the law firm of the future is going to be a really interesting thing to look at and discuss for sure. How do you think, just on that culture point, how do you think it has evolved over the past year? Um, you know, I, was Ballard open to, in your opinion, open to remote working prior to the pandemic? Um, and, and open is a, I guess, subjective <laughs> judgment. But, you know, and, and how do you see the firm's views on that changing? Or maybe even not Ballard specifically, how do you see firms of that size and stature viewing remote working now? Yeah, so I don't even think it was a Ballard issue in the past, but it was a large law firm issue where people were very, where firm management was very reluctant to see both lawyers and employees working remotely in the old environment just a year ago. I can't even believe it's been only a year, yeah. but I, but, but that's real. But the way that law firms are thinking about that, this issue now is, has completely transformed. Um, the way that we think about our business, and I think the way that we're going to think about the future. So even using the example of lateral partners or lateral attorneys that come to the firm, in the past, I know Ballard and other firms have grappled with the issue of, you know, do you allow someone who lives, for example, in Vermont to work out of New York if you know that they're only going to be in the New York office one day a week? Mm -hmm. um, I think now the firms are going to be much more open to that. And as a result, we might be able to attract better and different lateral candidates 
with, you know, different business. Um, and then employees will have more of an option, I think, to work remotely as long as there are certain parameters in place regarding that. And so I think we're much more open than we've been. And even me personally, you know, I'm thinking about what works best for my family. I have three small children, as you know. And so as we go back to school and as we think about what that looks like, would it be easier for me to work from home a couple of days a week or to go to our Mount Laurel, New Jersey office, which is five minutes away from my house instead of commuting to Philadelphia? And mm-hmm. I think all of those things are options. And um, so we've talked a lot about giving up office, you know, people specific office space and creating a hoteling environment for that so that we're much more flexible when people need the space. You know, I had not thought until you were just chatting, I had not thought about the office location, office footprint conundrum. You know, when I got into legal, what, I don't know, almost 15 years ago, there was a lot of talk about having an office in the place where your clients were. And I think that was already shifting, but Mm -hmm. sort of to the point of what you're just, you were just talking about, if you have somebody that's in Vermont, but able to service a client in New York, you know, or, or wherever, does that person physically have to be located in or around the area of where the client is, or do you physically need those locations in order to have that presence? Um, And like I said, I hadn't even thought about that, but that's such an interesting point. It'll be interesting to see how that changes. that's the question, right? Yeah, that's the question. And I think we always thought that that was the, that answer was, yes, you have to have an office in that location, but do you, and do the people need to be located there? As long as they're licensed and they can support that, you know, our, our clients are our business. And so as long as our clients are okay with that, we might, there might be completely different ways that we, you know, do business in the future. The rules are going to completely change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, so we have clients that are, you know, um, consumer fa- has consumer pa- facing practices. Obviously those are highly localized. People are going to want to hire a lawyer that is close to them, that is proven through, you know, search and all sorts of other things. But for, you know, these more sophisticated legal services. Yeah. And it, it like you said, it'll be interesting to see how that changes. Um, okay. So then my next question, which I, people often find a little bit more <laughs> challenging, what do you think should be changing in the legal industry? But it's probably going to take longer than we'd like. Well, I think it's I think it's the flip side of what I just mentioned. So for a long time, um, you know, we've been talking. I think COVID's changing everything, obviously. But we were talking mm-hmm. about the last the the recession in two thousand eight and two thousand nine, and how client. You know, my my role is extremely client facing, so I'm constantly thinking about how to meet the needs of clients. And the biggest. And from a value add perspective, clients are constantly saying that the biggest issue that they have with the current state of the legal market and what those services that law firms provide is the cost element. And so we've been working internally to be, and and so many other law firms have been too, but to be more efficient and to focus on client needs for cost reduction and cost certainty. And so we're building better budgets and we're managing our matters and we're trying to keep costs down. And when we're working internally on team structure, I mentioned diversity, but we're also looking at the who's doing the work. And so a lot of the conversations, you know, center around what's the scope of the work that needs to be done? And does this work require partner time? Or can we, or can it, can an associate or an of counsel or a paralegal help to perform some of the work so that the, so that it's less expensive for the firm? Um, I think the only way that we're going to truly change the way that we look at law firms as a business is to question all of the assumptions that we've had over the years about what we need to truly operate and function. You know, so that may mean that we don't have the highest quality space in a, in a legal market. You know, in Philadelphia, you don't have the views that law firms have or you partners don't have offices that are the size that partners are accustomed to, or we cut the marketing expenses that we have or the sponsorship expenses that we have in the budget each year. Um, and we have to start saying no to certain things and to make you know much better decision-making, you know, go through a much better decision-making process about all of those things. 
Because at the end of the day, what we need is quality legal talent. We need to foster and grow our lawyers. We want them to stay with us long term. We want them to deliver the highest quality service to our clients. And some of these overhead costs that we've been, you know, that that we've utilized over the years that we, and things that we've frankly grown accustomed to, um, we might need to rethink all of that. And I think that's that's the interesting conundrum we're in right now. Is this COVID thing a permanent shift in the way that we do business, or are we going to go back to the, the old way that we were doing things largely? And I think what we got to think about is making a permanent change in the mm -hmm. way we do business over time. And that's really, really challenging. Yeah. I'm going to latch on to something you said about like marketing expenses in there. As you know, I um, used to manage the marketing budgets at the firms where I worked and the um, the percentage of the marketing budget that was dedicated to activities that were done annually because they had to be without really any connection to um, value or client expansion or really measurable results was much higher than I would like to admit. And I think you hit the nail on the head, just reevaluating, are those things actually necessary? We had this entire, now an entire year under our belt where we couldn't do any of those things. And, or if we did, it was scaled back significantly. And so now, you know, are, how are you as attorneys, let's say, still engaging with those clients? Are those activities still necessary? Is that ad and that program yeah. book really still driving value? Um, and I don't think that those expenses, I would suspect those types of expenses are never going to go away completely because there are in fact things that have to be done for client relationships, but the the percentage of the to uh, you know percentage of the total definitely not what it was before i would say you're absolutely okay. right and i think we should be doing a better job of tracking our return on investment than law firms are and we should be questioning every time there is no return on the investment whether it's an investment that's worth our money and in some cases it might be in other cases we might have to say no but it's something we should definitely look at because if you look at the, the state of the industry last year, it's actually, well, this is, this is the stuff that I find fascinating, but law firms were so worried that we were gonna, you know, we were gonna lose revenue and our profitability was gonna go down. We actually saw that revenue increased year over year, even, you know, and, and, and not at a grand scale, but the costs of operating law firms went down so significantly that firms were largely very successful in terms of profitability and revenue because they were able to control those costs. Yeah. And so what we don't want to do is be faced with a situation where as we come out of COVID, clients are continuing to struggle in operating their businesses and law firms are struggling because they, you know, because they, you know, their, you know, businesses themselves and they need to generate revenue and then not being able to control the costs, you know, of operating the firms and, and seeing a, a down year or two that causes a recession for a law firm. Yeah. So it's so funny as I've been doing these interviews, I always have something I want to spend the next hour talking about. And when you talk about measuring return on investment for marketing expenses, you just hit the, you hit my sweet spot, my very favorite thing to talk <laughs> about. Um, I, I will say, I will say, and I think you'll appreciate this too. The challenge with that is the, the technology and the systems that are used and configured and used consistently enough to be able to capture the data that you need. I talk about this all the time where, you know, in professional services marketing, it's not like product marketing where it's, I put this ad up and I can see how many conversions I get from that yeah. ad. It's events and speaking engagements and relationships. I'm never going to argue with a lawyer who says, well, it's my relationship that brought in that business. You're right. But we as marketers are helping nurture that relationship with our emails and our invitations on your behalf and on the behalf of your practice and the firm. So anyway, I could get super nerdy about that. But in the interest of time, we'll save that for another conversation. <laughs> I would actually love that because I want to say more too. So <laughs> yeah. Um, so last question. Um, you are a font of wisdom and great advice. And I would love to know what advice you would like to share with our audience. What is a to-do that people can take away from this conversation? 
Well, I well, I there's a if you're a lawyer, I think the words of wisdom and you're and you're someone who's just starting out your career, you're still in law school. I think the most important part about the practice of law now in this current environment that I never realized when I graduated from law school is that um, is that you really got to understand the business of law mm-hmm. and understand technology. And if you understand technology and you understand how, you know, how to be more efficient using that technology to do the legal work that you will be doing in the future of your career, you're only going to be successful because that's the, you know, that's the future of where we're heading. And also understanding that law firms are businesses and, you know, it's the, you know, it's economics 101, you bring in revenue, but then you have to figure out what the cost to do the work is. And at the end of the day, that results in the profit. And so I think what I didn't understand when I graduated from law school enough is that, um, is that you, at the end of the day, what matters is how much revenue you're generating to give back to the partners of the firm, because it, because it creates a situation where, you know, then people are making money, but also you can attract better talent, which is what clients need because we're a professional services business and our talent is everything. And so, um, so focusing on those two things will make you largely successful as a lawyer. Um, And then I just want to give a shout out to, um, you know, that, that, you know, the concept of like women supporting women is very, very important in my life. And so I think that in order to be successful in your career, no matter what you're doing as a woman, we have to, you, you know, you have to work really, really hard and you have to do great quality work. But you also, I, I think it's important to give back and to really support other women. And so creating mentorship opportunities, developing professional relationships with people where you can, you know, act as sounding boards for one another and just be there for each other, both in the challenges and in the successes is extremely important. And so um, that's really one of the focuses that I have this year in terms of my own, um, my, my own environment with my own tribe of women is to really continue to foster and grow that because I just think it's so important. Yeah, I well, again, you know that I totally agree with you. And I love that you made it a point to share that because it, it is so critically important. And the thing that I have found, especially over the past year, like you in, in really making that a focus is the more we do it, the easier it gets, the, you know, and more we see the fruits of our labor. Um, so I, I applaud you for being a woman who supports women. And I thank you for being part of my tribe and <laughs> supporting all the things that I'm doing in terms of, you know, getting the word out about women supporting women as well. So thank you so much. And, and thank, thank you, you for, you. yeah, thanks for being on my show today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so delighted to be here. So thank you. Thank you so much.